Everyone wants to take their business, their skills, to the next level. Small and mid-sized business owners have exceptional insight into how to do this. They endure and thrive because they find ways to overcome the challenges that come their way, and they can teach us valuable lessons to apply to our own companies and lives. Stephen Nooner, founder and owner of Alkali, a company with a unique process that helps businesses more effectively buy and manage their insurance programs. And Bob Gibbons, builder of Riata Commercial Realty, a real estate advisor and tenant advocate, are two prominent Metroplex businessmen who, along with their weekly guests, will ask their and your probing questions, finding impactful solutions that will help you reach for the next level. Here are your hosts, Stephen Nooner and Bob Gibbons. Welcome, everyone, to the next level. I'm your host, Stephen Nooner. That's right. Did you forget? And you are? Well, I know who I am. <laughs> I'm Bob Gibbons. <laughs> and uh, we're here with Mark Sinatra today. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, introduce my friend, uh, Mark, who is the CEO of Staff One HR. Staff One helps companies stay focused on their core business while they handle a lot of the HR needs that they have. They are based here in Dallas. They employ 46 people and have clients in 44 states. If you want to learn more wow. about Mark or Staff One, visit them at staffone.com. And then is that is that one numeral one or spelled out O-N-E? O-N-E. Okay. Like V-1. Just want to make sure they're going to get to the right place. That's right. You know, the internet can be scary if you do it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, so, Mark. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Glad you're here. Yeah. Well, we always like Glad to, to start here. off with the uh, wisdom of others before we get to the wisdom of you. And uh, our wisdom today, we actually... Uh, are using a quote that you brought, uh, which is, I am a great believer in luck. The harder I work, the more I seem to have of it. But we don't know who said that. A lot of people seem to have said that in one way or another over the years. That's what I've heard. And, um, you know, on the internet, I think you can see it was possibly tied to Thomas Jefferson, but then there's a lot of other philosophers and businessmen and people that have been attributed to that quote. But, you know, for me, I think it carries personal significance because I can go into this later, but the, the way that I got involved with Staff One was through an acquisition. I mean, I, I raised money to acquire the business and um, it's kind of a daunting task, right? It's not like, hey, there's a lot of companies that want to be acquired that are knocking on your door, right? So <laughs> you have to you have to really make a lot of calls and, and talk to a lot of people. And, and this quote for me meant, you know, it, it just meant that I'm in the position I'm in today because, um, you know, I had to put in a lot of hours, you know, just calling folks, introducing myself, going to trade shows and meeting a lot of people. And, you know, it was one of those deals where, you know, I talked to someone in the industry and six months later out of the blue, got a, got a call from that person, you know, about this opportunity. So you just never know uh, wow. what kind of luck you can, uh, wow. you know, run into just if you just work hard enough. Yeah. Um, we have a saying in our office who always say we work like it depends all on us and pray like it depends all on God. Kind of like in that intersection, yeah. you'll have, you know, the blessings will show up. So um, I thought you were yeah. quoting Rob Deerdeck, who has the professional skateboarder. No? Oh, uh, no, no. I, I gave up skateboarding <laughs> when I was uh, five years old. Sorry. Wow. Yeah, it's a kind of a sort top thank you uh, thank you steve for bringing that up there <laughs> bad memories yeah yeah <laughs> i have a lot of scars from skateboarding when i was a kid <laughs> so what did he say Stephen? don't don't bait us yeah. and then drop it you said make your own luck in fact he's got uh, uh with dc shoes and i mean he's got oh, nice. posters and everything else and yes i'm uh, my wife doesn't let me skateboard now we have kids but i still have one in the garage so hey i'm, I'm, oh, I'm nice. over 50 and one of my buddies who's over 50 also is in a skate club for dudes over 50 i was like That's i can't awesome. believe this even exists wow Wow. I might ought to get back into it. There you go. I can that's see amazing. you rolling with your fanny pack. <laughs> <laughs> fanny Man. pack and escape. That's a dangerous that, combo. You, you can just, do a lot of damage with that. You're going to be damaged. To yourself you or to others. No, for others sure. are going to beat you up. <laughs> <laughs> so full that's disclosure, awesome. I'm going to jump into business a little bit. Um, sure. Full disclosure to the audience, uh, no Mark. I've uh, known him for a while and, you know, we've been doing some work together. So I'm going to ask questions that are a little bit leading, but just because I want to create a picture of what you do for our audience, because I think you can provide a lot of value. Um, so why don't you start off kind of telling us what Staff One does specifically? 
Sure. Yes. Uh, Staff One HR. You know, we're a full service HR outsourcing organization. You know, based here in Dallas, um, we provide uh, basically the entire suite of, of HR services that a small, medium sized business needs to thrive and to grow. Um, so specifically, you know, that includes HR consulting, HR compliance, uh, payroll and tax administration, uh, employee benefits administration, and then workers compensation or workplace safety. And so um, we, you know, provide all those services from uh, our offices, from mm-hmm. our internal corporate employees. And so what it really looks like is, you know, we, we provide these solutions on um, on a recurring basis to our clients. You know, we have, uh, you know, hundreds of clients and, and many of them have been with us for, for several years where we are essentially kind of their outsourced HR department. You know, most of our business is deployed through a, uh, a what we call a, a PEO service model. Um, and, and there's, um, you know, it's been a growing part of HR outsourcing the, the PEO uh, service model what, what is P- uh, stands stuff? for uh, professional employer organization. Okay. It's basically where, you know, as, as the HR outsourcing company, um, we are the employer of record for purposes of, uh, you know, processing payroll, remitting and filing payroll taxes. So it's not the old employee in leasing nature. thing, is it, from the 80s? Uh, it, it's a little different where uh, we specifically and clearly codify in our client service agreement you know, our clients to work side employer. So we're not actually, you know, we, we don't hire those employees and lease them back. You know, our, our client has complete control over their employees and over how they run their business. And we are essentially just in the background providing all of the back office, you know, HR support there. Okay. So there's um, a lot of companies that do pieces of what you do. Like you mentioned payroll. I've, you know, a client that does payroll. I have a client that does yeah. all these other things, HR benefit or HR, and then somebody else that does other things. So are you sort of a, an umbrella that does all these things, putting them all together to do them better because they're all under one house versus somebody going and doing them individually. Yeah, uh, yeah, for the most part, and that, that's that is a a big driver of why companies would use us is is kind of that one stop shop. I and mean, you think of a, a of an average business, right, that has thirty employees, and you know they've got almost as many vendors, right? So, um, I mean, it's hard to manage that um, mm-hmm. as it, I mean, so it's, th- that that's certainly a big benefit. Um, but I will say also that um, we've developed really good partnerships, uh, particularly in the, uh, you know, in the employee benefits arena where, you know, we, um, this is one of the ways we set ourselves apart is we're completely open architecture there where we allow our clients to, to design their own benefit plans in conjunction with a broker that they have or the we recommend, and that's kind of how um, Stephen and I got, got, you know, first first met there. Uh, we also allow our clients, if it makes sense, to have their own workers comp program, and we'll do all the workplace safety. So we're, you know, we're we have our own uh, internal products on the benefits and and the workers comp, but sometimes you know it may make sense for a client to have their own. So we have a we have a little bit of a flexible model where you know a, a traditional PEOs, it's really a, a one size fits all take it all or leave it. And we're, we're little, we're a lot different than that. So, and that's one of the things that I think <clears throat> is really unique being that we obviously work and know with multiple PEOs and payroll companies and, and not everyone is always a right, perfect match for everybody. And, and what is unique, a couple of things that I've been impressed with Mark and staff one is, is the open architecture that they really do have a lot of flexibility in regards to the different pieces um, and, and, and just trying to do the right thing for the right for the client. So they they have a lot more flexibility than some of the other PEOs, like you mentioned. The other thing is um, a lot of companies will say that they actually provide, you know, HR services, but that can mean all kinds of different things. And one thing that I think is really impressive uh, with Mark, I'll let you talk a little bit. This is the kind of the audits and the service load agreement and how you kind of help maybe companies that haven't had, they have some gaps they need to close, help them actually get them on track. Yeah, and, and uh, thanks for thanks for that question because, um, you know, this is something I'm v- really passionate about is this one I'm seeing, um, and, and I really call it, you know, kind of the new HR paradigm that business owners are, are dealing with now. I mean, you know, the number of employment laws, regulations and rules, I mean, has increased exponentially, Mm -hmm. you know, in the last 10 to 15 years. And so employers now are challenged more now than ever to figure out how to comply with all of this. Um, So we really, um, we take a proactive approach when it comes to compliance. And one of the first things we do is we have our credentialed accredited HR manager 
uh, as part of our team. They're kind of the quarterback of our service team. They sit down with a new client. They go through uh, an HR gap analysis that really identifies, well, here's here's what you're not doing today. Here's what you're doing that can be updated, and here's what you should be doing. And so we that basically kind of uh, completes a service plan uh, that we have for the client for over the course of the first year of the relationship, and we've got key milestones with dates and owners and all that stuff. And So let me ask you a question about the gap analysis yeah. that you're doing there. So when you have somebody that – calls you up and says, hey, I want to talk to you about this. And you go in there and you do that gap. How often are they you finding things that they didn't even know they were missing? <laughs> I mean, all the time. I mean, always- I must, that's, <laughs> I mean, that's really like, that, that's a big driver on why they hire us. We try to, if we do a good job, um, you know, consulting in the sales process and discovery, um, we will usually pinpoint those things, you know, and we'll present them during the proposal process. Okay. But then we take a much deeper dive when the client comes on board. But I mean, 100% of the time, we will find yeah. things, um, and it could be anything. I mean, it could be, you know, a job just job description's not being done. I mean, it could be, you know, a handbook. I mean, it, it just... It so who is anything. your ideal client? Our, our ideal client, I'll, I'll answer that in two ways. One is, you know, ideal client is, is an organization that wants to professionalize. They've, they're at that inflection point whether it's growth, whether it's expansion, um, or maybe they, they, they lost a key person and they, they're taking that opportunity to really invest in professionalizing their business. They care about their employees, they value HR, but they understand that HR is a discipline and an expertise that they don't have the internal core competency to meet. Um, and so what does that really translate to? You know, Our average size client has 30 employees, our smallest has two, our largest has 700. It's a huge range there, but the majority of our clients have between 10 and 200 employees. That's where okay. the majority of them fall under. And, uh, you know, we're in 44 states. Um, you know, most of our clients are based in the south, southwest, and, and southeast. Why not so. the other six? You know, we if, <laughs> HR we, complexity. We, well, we're, we are we're still at only 50 states, we're, right? We're hoping we get, and I, last I checked, I, that may have changed recently, but. Um, you know, we're, we're hopefully get some good uh, good referrals for the other six. So, <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Stephen, you got anything to follow up with that? Well, I'm just being a smartass over here. Yeah, you're the expert here. Well, <laughs> usually uh, aren't the roles reversed? Yeah, I thought so. You guys are switching it up today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the other thing too with that list, I mean, because is that there are different quadrant levels. You can always find something, Bob, that's out of compliance with almost anyone. In fact, usually the people that I find that tell me that they have it all together, like it, I always have to remind my clients, they're like, oh, I have someone they want to, I want to refer you to, but they already have it all together really. Or I'm like, you remember, you thought you had it all together when we got together as well. So there's a lot of times there's gaps um, and, and it's figuring out what those are and what's on fire versus what's, I mean, cause you can really get down to, you know, you can make a compliance issue out of almost anything, but there's, there's real compliance issues that, and then there's gotchas. And so they really, you know, with, they are prioritize them and help them close those. And I think that's pretty unique. Cause again, a lot of the, the alternative model with a lot of other, the PEOs, I mean, some of them, they're all different levels, but a lot of them will say that they do that. But really what you get is a boilerplate handbook. You might get an HR person to return your call and get, you know, give you an answer when you talk, but they're, but they're not going to give that level of service. So it's a different mindset the client has to have to, to engage in that. Okay. Well, we're going to take a break and we come back, we're going to talk more about Mark's business. And uh, we're also going to ask him, what do you do when you lose your biggest client that represents a huge portion of your company's revenue. How do you react? I bet you're excited to answer that one. And I, I, I'll, I'll be right back, guys. Trust me. <laughs> and now, confessions of a recovering landlord. This is Bob Gibbons with Riata Commercial Realty, and I am your recovering landlord. After 20 years as a landlord, I now use that experience only for the benefit of companies that lease or buy office buildings and warehouses. Today's confession, knowledge is power. We all negotiate from a position of power and strength, or at least we want to. In any negotiation, the party with the most knowledge probably has the upper hand. And landlords count on this being the case whenever uh, you're negotiating a lease, because most landlords are professional real estate investors and they hire professional leasing agents and property managers. Landlords are in the market every day negotiating leases, while tenants probably only negotiate one, maybe two leases every few years. So tenants feel outgunned. 
Don't let landlords have all the power. As a former landlord for 20 years, I understand how landlords think and what motivates them. So let me put that knowledge and experience to work on your side of the negotiation. To learn more, contact me at texastenantrep.com. Again, that's texastenantrep.com. Have you started making plans to take your business to the next level in 2016? Hi, I'm Stephen Nooner, founder and CEO of Alkali. We have a trademark process called the Empowered Advantage that enables CEOs, business owners, and entrepreneurs to more effectively buy and manage their insurance. Before sitting down to make your plans for the new year, here are just a few things to consider. Would you say that you have an actual insurance strategy, one that you can articulate, or have you just purchased a policy here and there over the years? If you have an insurance strategy, was it discussed under the pressure of a renewal deadline or considered earlier in the year to avoid fire drill decision making? If your answer was no to either of these questions, then you may not have the right partner on your team. Visit AlkaliServices.com to contact us and take the next step to a bigger and better future. This is Betsy Bates. I'm the former owner of Corporate Green Interior Foliage, and I just had the pleasure of being on the program with Stephen and Bob. And it was about as exciting as watching a plant grow. (laughs) Welcome back to the next level. Conversations that propel business. Stephen was going to start this, but I just jumped in front of him. I feel terrible. (laughs) You should. You should. I never will. We're here with our (laughs) special guest, Mark Sinatra. Uh, He is the CEO of Staff One. If you would like to learn more, please go to staffone.com. And how do you spell staff? S T A F F O N E. It's a good question. A lot of people ask that. That's kind of scary. I hope not. Uh, No, no. (laughs) Ask something intelligent, Stephen. Yeah, well, um, I I know you've been working really hard on uh, a new capability you guys are excited about. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's this HR 2.0 initiative. And I I briefly referenced it before in the last segment about the new HR paradigm. But the reality is, um, from a compliance perspective, from a hiring, hiring and retention perspective, and from a training perspective, the the world of being an employer has changed significantly. Mm-hmm. I mean, now even versus you know three or four years ago, um, I mentioned compliance before, but if you look at the, um, the the hiring market, right, the average number of days a job is vacant in today's market is twenty eight days. I don't understand how an employer can profitably grow at that you know, at that rate, right? Um, you know, the new workforce, you know, millennials, 75% of the workforce uh, will be a millennial in, in eight years. Great. So, wow. you know, the future is now. So um, what we're doing is we are uh, preparing our clients to really embrace HR 2.0, use it as a competitive advantage. So specifically, we're what working with them on services uh, and technology, but from the service end, really helping them identify, you know, and, and specifically their company culture, mm-hmm. how to maximize their employee engagement, you know, positioning themselves as an employer that, you know, it's really, you know, a, an employer that people want to work for because you just can't place a job ad out there nowadays. Right. And this is for any industry, by the way. I mean, this is for blue collar, gray collar, white collar. You just can't place a job ad and, and thinking you're going to get a ton of qualified people. It's just not reality. So um, we're really helping our clients on their hiring strategies their reten- and their client retention strategies. Um, I talked about proactive compliance before. And then from my technology, oh, you go ahead. You said client, employee retention. Is that what you meant? Employee retention. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. And then and then um, from a technology perspective, um, you know, the new workforce is, is you know, clearly very uh, proficient with technology. And so we, we have a platform that's automated, you know, the entire employee lifecycle all the way from, you know, pre-hire through onboarding through, you know, kind of steady state, you know, employee management. So, you know, we're excited to, and we're always constantly trying to tweak that. You know, we're looking into some, some uh, hopefully some upgrades on uh, mobile optimization on that as well. But that's really where, you know, the future is now. And so we're just trying to help our clients get there. Okay. So, so let's get this personal. You have a lot of employees of your own. 46 is, I think yes. you said you have 46 employees in your company. So yeah. what is, how do you manage your own employees and, uh, and why do your employees want to work for you versus your competitors? Yeah. 
It's a great question, you know, and, and it's something that we have to, and we we continually work very hard on uh, on on striving to be, you know, the best employer in our industry, you know, in in our market. Um, I mean, the first thing is understanding, you know, the employee engagement factor, right? And so one of the first things is, you know, understanding, you know, really documenting, you know, the the career, you know, documenting the career path for that employee, making sure that that employee is put in a position that's aligned with their strengths. Um, so, you know, we, I think, do a good job on the interview and selection process to mm -hmm. determine, you know, what those strengths of the employee are and, and ensuring that those are aligned with the right skills. So really setting that employee up from success, you know, for success from the, from the get-go. Is there a magic number as to how many interviews somebody should have before they get made an offer? You know, for us, it depends a little bit on the position and how cross-functional it is. You know, we do try to involve uh, many individuals at all levels and from different departments um, because of what we do. You know, payroll, what someone in payroll could do could affect HR and someone in benefits could affect, you know, payroll. So, sure. you know, we do try to involve, um, you know, many different levels you know i i try to get personally involved to the extent i can in, in the interview and selection process um I, i'm really happy about this you know 75 percent of our new hires have come from an employee referral that's huge so wow. you know it's a leading metric that we look at to to say well i mean are we doing a good job internally to ensure that you know this is a, a great place to work and so um you know i like that metric i obviously um you know want that to uh you know to continue and then lastly it's just kind of basic stuff. I mean, I wish I could give, you know, a kind of a secret, but it's really just being actively listening to the employees, you know, securing feedback, acting on that feedback. And, and that as a result, you know, that builds a trust cycle, right. As an, as an employer and employees, you know, they just want to know, they want to have that trust factor at a very, very high level. So compensation, you notice I didn't even, I just mentioned compensation, sure. right. So that's obviously a, a data point, but, um, and for us that we focus on, you know, very seriously on, but it's not the only data point, right? I mean, yeah. at this, I just brought it up in this conversation. Yeah, it's in the consideration set, but once people know that they're going to be compensated fairly, then all the other variables I find tend to be what people focus on, right? Yes. Are they gonna like the work environment? Are they gonna, you know, have leadership they feel like they can trust? And, you know, those things that are, unfortunately, maybe not always status quo anymore, right? That's right. So, um, well, appreciate sharing that. Um, so let's talk. Uh, I mean, Bob mentioned, alluded to this, the hook. You, you, you said you were going to dodge out maybe. <laughs> you were coming back. Yeah. Uh, pain points. I mean, you mentioned that you had had a big uh, breakdown in 2011 losing a client and how that had been a breakthrough. So once you kind of share that, because um, I think we can all learn from that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, it's um, something that – um, candidly, I haven't, I, I'm just now kind of getting comfortable, you know, talking about, I mean, I've certainly I've reflected on it. Sure. Um, and, uh, it kind of culminated when I was real quick, sorry, I was at the Inc 5,000 conference last year and, mm -hmm. and Marcus Limonis from the profit spoke Yeah. Mm -hmm. and he goes around, he's, he's talking about vulnerability, right? And mm -hmm. so He's going around, you know, the 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 room there is like fifteen hundred people, and he's selecting people. And of course, for whatever reason, he chose me. I definitely did not volunteer. He chose me <laughs> to tell the audience one thing that you know that no one else that was business related that no one else knew about me in the room. And for whatever reason, I chose that topic was was talking about you know, the, the experience of going through losing a client that was, you know, at that time, for, you know, 40%, you know, of, of our business. Ouch. And, um, you know, it was one of those things that you take two steps back to, to go forward. And, uh, I, you know, in that particular case, you know, running a service-based company, um, you know, it's kind of sometimes the tail wagging the dog where, you know, it felt like, you know, the, the, the company, our company couldn't really move forward unless we diversified our client base. And while it certainly hurt big time from a financial perspective, sure. um, you know, I think it really did help us become a better company going through that experience. You know, I, I found, um, and I was, I'd never been through that before. Right. So, yeah. you know, being really open and honest about the communication and like, 
trying to do the opposite from hiding away from it, but just being really upfront about, hey, you know, this is this is what happened. Here's what the impact is. You know, I did have to unfortunately, you know, let go of some people that were really, really good team members, and mm-hmm. that that hurt. That's I mean, tough. I still hate even you know thinking about that. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the um, you know the business was able to to thrive afterwards. Um, but you know, it took going through that experience to I think I really think to get to where we are today so so what did you learn from that what do you do differently now to make sure you don't end up back in that position well you know one thing is is that um you know obviously it was it was a large client and so um you know from it 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 goes back to one of the mantras okay well you treat you know we treat every client the same Mm -hmm. but in reality um when you run a service business um, you have to look at, okay, well, say of your top, top 30 clients, you know, say they account for 60%, right. Mm-hmm. Of your, of your profit or of your revenue. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, having a tiered service model where you're able to allocate, you know, the right amount of resources and the right depth of resources to those top 30 uh, is something that you know we incorporated shortly after you know, hmm. losing this client because um, you know I determined that you know having a universal approach to all clients just really was not effective and so going to this tiered model um, I think has has made us a, a much more I mean it's helped us grow right because I mean our client retentions like. 90 plus percent every year so it's really helped us with our growth well not every client's going to value the same things yeah. so why force them to take something that they really don't value and or and pay for that exactly you know, give let them have a stripped down model and let somebody else pay for the premium that's exactly right yeah so we the, the model now is much more agile based on you know the the, the client uh, needs and what they value so mm-hmm. that's a great point where do you have to focus most to stay on track? I mean, you've got a, a growing business. I mean, a lot of things going on. I know you're actively involved in day to day. I mean, you're a hands on guy. So how do you stay on track? It, it is a, uh, it is a continual challenge. I mean, there's a number of things. Um, you know, I really, uh, hold myself accountable to setting aside time at the end of the week, um, to do weekly focusing for, you know, the following week or two. And so I go through a rhythm where ensuring that, you know, the voicemails, um, I use Evernote a lot to track like to do items, um, go through email from the week and I prioritize email, just ensuring that all open loops have been closed out. Right. Um, now of course, sometimes that goes into the weekend. Um, so, you know, I just have to be careful on, you know, when I work on the weekend, so it doesn't really cut into, you know, the work life balance. Um, no one answer, but that, that's been a, a rhythm that's worked for me. Do you actually block time then for, for that, that routine or I usually do like on a Friday afternoon, if, if it doesn't work, then it's a task item in my outlook. Mm-hmm. And so it just, it pops up as a reminder, um, that I need to do. So if I find myself with a half hour block and I'm trying to do it earlier. So like I did a li- actually a little bit of it this morning and so I'll finish it up, uh, you know, uh, later today or tomorrow. Well, I don't know why you say you're so busy. I mean, you're only on the board of the Kukaloo Foundation, a board director of first three years, a partner in Social Ventured Partners, NY Young President's uh, organization, involved in prison entrepreneur program. I mean, my goodness, that is makes my head spin just thinking about all those different things. It's it's a um yeah, it, it is a balance and I uh it's a it's a tough one. I mean one of the quotes that I was was I was gonna present was um you know, Warren Buffett, right? He's, he's very famous for saying that he says no to, you know, 99% of the the things that are presented to him. And, um, you know, I think that's an area of opportunity for me. I mean, I, I like to be involved, you know, and, and, um, it's just particularly things I'm, you know, I'm really passionate about and, um, I get a lot of enjoyment out of that, but, you know, I can tend to go a little extreme at times. So I need to balance that. What's next? For after uh, I get through, we're going to grab lunch, right? <laughs> <laughs> I like a man with priorities. <laughs> well, Mark, appreciate your time today. Uh, thank you for joining us. Mark Sinatra with Staff One. If you want to connect with Mark or learn more about Staff One, please visit staffone.com. That's O N E, Bob. Thank you. And uh, if you want to connect down. with us or the show, uh, please visit nextlevelshow.com. That's S H O W. That's right. 
Uh, we're on Facebook, other social media as well, Twitter. Uh, if you heard something today that would be valuable to someone else, maybe you know someone that could benefit from knowing Mark uh, or Staff One, uh, please help spread the word. See you next week. Thanks, guys. You have been listening to The Next Level, conversations that propel business with Stephen Nooner and Bob Gibbons. Join us every Tuesday at 1.30 p.m. for more prolific conversations that will take your business to the next level.